So in this lesson we're going to look at several types of thermometers that do not involve electrical signals, specifically bimetallic thermometers, filled thermal systems, and liquid in glass thermometers. Now for bimetallic thermometers I generally like to start the lesson by actually demonstrating them but I don't have it in front of me here so I'll have to look at some diagrams. So in diagram A this bimetallic strip two metals A and B bonded together are linear straight at room temperature but when they're placed in an ice water bath the bimetallic strip bends downwards in this example and when heated the bimetallic strip bends in the opposite direction up and when they return to room temperature they become straight again. So what's going on here? So bimetallic strips have a firmly bonded sandwich of two metals that have different coefficients of thermal expansion which means that they expand a different amount for the same temperature change look at the diagram here on the left. If a bimetallic strip is flat, the differential expansion of the two metals causes a bending motion. Notice that the high expansion coefficient metal is on the outer edge of this curve and so it's longer than the length of the low expansion coefficient metal which occupies the inside of the curve of the strip diagram on the right here. If the strip is wound into a helix and the lower end of the helix is fixed, the upper end is attached to a dial on a scale. The differential expansion of the two metals will cause a twisting motion which indicates the temperature on a calibrated circular scale. Perhaps you've seen this type of bimetallic thermometer before. They're common to use in cooking. Here's another application for a thermometer with a bimetallic coil and a pointer is attached to the end of it and it's pointing towards the left side of the scale which indicates a low temperature. On heating this coil will open a bit and the needle is thus turned clockwise and indicates to the right side of this temperature scale. Notice this bimetallic strip is made of steel and copper or brass. So the principle of operation is motion caused by differential expansion of metals of different coefficients of thermal expansion. Pretty wide range from minus 40 up to about 425 Celsius. The accuracy is only plus or minus 1% of the span. Now the span is the highest temperature minus the lowest temperature. So in this example the span would be 425 minus a negative 40 which is actually 465 Celsius degree temperature span. And 1% of that is about 4.6 degrees plus or minus which is not all that precise if you think about it. On a temperature of around 400 plus or minus 4.5 is not bad but on a temperature of say plus or minus 10 well plus or minus 4 would be a significant variation. The speed of the response is faster than liquid and glass thermometers because they're made of metal housing and the components therefore have high thermal conductivity. Some advantages, well they're reasonably accurate. They have simple rugged construction. They have large easy to read scales. The bulk diameter is small which means that their mass should not affect the sample temperature too much. The mechanical action of the bimetallic strip can be used in temperature controllers, for example, when connected to a mercuroid switch in a home heating thermostat. Perhaps you've seen one. They look like this. Here's a old style home heating thermostat. Inside the thermostat you'll see a coil, a bimetallic coil, and attached to it is a glass vial containing liquid mercury. Mercury is a liquid at room temperature. So when the temperature in the room is hot the coil is opened such that the bead of mercury falls to the left side of this diagram, this picture, 
and here are two electrical connections that are live but they're not making contact so at the present time the furnace would be shut off. When the temperature in the room lowers then the metallic coil will unfold tilting this glass vial such that the mercury bead will roll to the right hand side and make contact between the two leads and the completes the circuit and the furnace will turn on. So and it'll stay that way until the room gets warm and the coil unfolds again and retilts the vial such that the mercury bead rolls away from the contacts and opens the circuit and the furnace shuts off. These have been in use for decades in home heating thermostats. Now I've put some links on Blackboard to some video clips showing some rather novel and fun uses of these mercroid switches in making Christmas lights and other decorative lights. You might want to look at that if you're interested. And that's it for bimetallic thermometers. On page 17 we'll look at filled thermal systems. Another important type of industrial thermometer is called a filled thermal system. They consist of a closed unit under pressure made of a bulb connected by capillary tubing to a helical or C-shaped Borden tube. Take a look at one here. This is a filled thermal system. We see a bulb, that's the sensor, and a coil connected to the gauge. I'll explain the Borden tube in just a minute filled thermal system thermometers are designated as class 1 if they are liquid filled or class 2 if they are liquid and vapor in equilibrium so these would be low boiling liquids or class 3 if they're gas filled. Take a look at a Borden tube so a Borden tube is a helical or C-shaped tube this one's C-shaped in all types of filled thermal system thermometers an increase in temperature would cause an increase in pressure of the liquid and or vapor and the increase in pressure will cause the Borden tube to want to open up a bit. The C-shape or helix will open. Now why would it do that? Well there's greater surface area or greater length on the outer surface than on the inner surface and so we could argue that if pressure is being applied there's more collisions per unit time on the larger surface than there are on the inner surface and those larger number of collisions per second translate to greater pressure on the outer surface it tends to open up. Now it's just a small motion but it's leveraged and exaggerated with a long needle connected to a scale. The scale can be calibrated in Celsius degrees to read temperature but can also be calibrated in pressure units so Borden tubes can be used to make pressure gauges the same as a temperature gauge simply change the dial. Among the Borden tubes class 2 systems are most common and they do need some compensation or adjustment that the manufacturer does so here's why. Consider the case where the bulb is say hotter than the Borden tube and so in a class 2 system, a mixture of vapor and liquid, some of the liquid will vaporize and all the liquid will then be in the Borden tube rather than in the bulb. In the case where the sensor is colder than the Borden tube, then the liquid will condense and lie inside the bulb. This small difference in where the liquid resides causes a slight pressure change within the system, but that's compensated by the manufacturer. Capillary tubing can be up to 100 feet long for class 1 systems, that's liquid filled systems, and wide temperature range is measurable from minus 400 up to 1000 degrees Fahrenheit, which is pretty hot. Now I've seen this on a few occasions, uh, a dip effect. So if you immerse a bulb of a filled thermal system thermometer into a hot solution momentarily the temperature on the gauge may actually drop and the reason for that is the the bulb may expand quickly in the hot temperatures causing some of the material to fall back and the gauge indicates a lowering in temperature but it corrects itself within about 10 seconds. Page 18 so 
Class 1 filling liquids include high boiling liquids like mercury or chlorobenzene. Class 2, which are low boiling liquids, a mixture of liquid and vapor, would contain low boiling liquids such as ethyl ether, typical ether we use in the organic lab, ethanol or benzene, and then class 3 filled thermal systems contain strictly gases like ethane and propane, dimethyl ether, ethyl chloride, and such. And that's it for filled thermal system thermometers. On page 9 we have liquid in glass thermometers, the ones that students are probably most familiar with and the principle is the volumetric expansion of a fluid. So these are very common in industry, particularly in the laboratory. Now if you look at the diagram, there's a number of items identified that I'll bet you don't know what they all are, so let's go over them. Uh, the bulb is the sensing part and it typically has a thin wall here around it. Why is that? Well, because glass is not a good conductor of heat, and so by making it thinner, we speed up their response to temperature change. But of course, that makes them more susceptible to breakage at the bulb area, so be careful there. Sitting above that, we have a round cavity called the range suppression cavity, and that will have to be filled before the liquid enters the stem of the thermometer. And so the manufacturer can adjust the range of the thermometer by altering the size of the range suppression cavity. So some thermometers read low temperature only and some read high temperature only and some read a broad range and that can be adjusted by the manufacturer by changing the range suppression cavity. In this particular thermometer we see a thin part of the bore called the maximum indication constriction. So it's thin such that liquid will be able to move up as the thermometer bulb is heated, but the liquid will not fall back down by itself unless it's actually shaken down by the user. And the purpose of that is to indicate the maximum temperature that was registered on a thermometer. And this was commonly used in medical thermometers. So this constriction would allow the maximum temperature of the patient to be read, but when the thermometer is removed from their mouth, the nurse has time to read it before it cools off. And one Fahrenheit degree it might be important in a medical diagnosis. Sitting above the maximum indication constriction is a, often you'll see a line scribed, and in this particular kind of thermometer it's called a partial immersion thermometer. It has a partial immersion line, and this is the depth to which the thermometer should be immersed to read properly. That's the way it was calibrated. We'll talk more about that in just a little bit. At the uh, top of the thermometer we have this bulb called an overload capacity. So if you, by mistake, overheat a thermometer, liquid will move to the top of the bore and will actually break the top of the thermometer off. It doesn't explode, it just quietly breaks and drops off. So this overload capacity gives a little more lenience or forgiveness to avoid that from happening. The industrial style versions of liquid and glass thermometers are much the same except that glass being fragile is usually protected by a metal case or housing. It'll have often a glass front and the calibrations might be on the case rather than the thermometer itself. Now different types of thermometers are calibrated such that they should be immersed to different depths. There's bulb immersion, stem immersion or partial immersion, partial immersion or stem immersion is what we looked at at the top of this page, total immersion and complete immersion. And we'll look at those on page 20. So on the far left we see what's called a bulb immersion thermometer and just the bulb of the thermometer is immersed in the liquid and that's how it's calibrated so you should read it that way. Commonly in the lab we use what are called partial immersion thermometers and there's a line scribed on the thermometer and that's the immersion depth at which it's been calibrated. A total immersion thermometer should be immersed such that the I'll say mercury, the mercury thread is completely immersed but only at that depth. 
So if the mercury moves higher, you push the thermometer deeper, keep the immersion depth the same as the height of the mercury or liquid thread. And finally we have what are called complete immersion thermometers. Just as the name implies, the thermometer is completely immersed in the liquid. And that's the way they calibrate it. So if you don't immerse them to the correct depth, they won't read correctly. Here are some accuracy requirements for liquid and glass thermometers. The liquid should have a large and constant coefficient of thermal expansion, which means that as they heat up or cool down, the liquid should expand or contract significantly so we get a change in the reading. The adhesion of the fluid to the glass should be low. The cohesion should be greater than the adhesion. Cohesion refers to the tendency of a material to stick to itself. Adhesion refers to the tendency of a material to stick to something else. Think of the word adhesives. They're like glues designed to stick two different materials together. So we want our liquid that's in the glass to cohere to itself more than to the glass. Because if it sticks to the glass, then it'll hold up and you have beads forming in the glass. And that's not good. It's not going to read properly. And for that reason, water is not a suitable fluid for a glass thermometer because water adheres quite well to glass. Now the fluid should be visible, and so we often use a dye if it's an alcohol. Here's a couple of pictures here. For general purpose thermometers, you often see red dye in an alcohol for general purpose. For low temperature thermometers, they typically use a blue dye. And of course, mercury doesn't need a dye because it's a silver liquid and can be seen without the addition of a dye. And finally, the fluids freezing and boiling points must satisfy the desired range of use. So in the case of mercury, its freezing point is minus 39 Celsius. Its boiling point is plus 357. So that would define the range it's usable in. We need it to be a liquid. In fact, the range that's used for mercury thermometers can be from minus 40 up to plus 500. Now you wonder, well, how can it be used up to 500 if it boils at 357? Well, 357 is the normal boiling point of mercury. Some mercury thermometers can be read up to 500 because they are filled with gas under pressure. And that raises the boiling point of a liquid, right? To prevent the mercury in the bulb and stem from boiling and condensing at the top of the thermometer. For ethanol, the freezing point is minus 115. Its boiling point is 78. So its usable range is around minus 100 up to about 110. Again, filled with gas pressurized to raise the normal boiling point to some higher value. With regards to accuracy, an industrial thermometer might typically have an accuracy of plus or minus 1% of the span. That might be acceptable. In the laboratory, we probably want something more accurate, so plus or minus 0.1% of the span is likely what we would see. So disadvantages, well, they're fragile, right? easy to break. They are slow to respond. They have temperature lag due to the thermal resistance of glass. The readability is good only at close range. It can be very difficult to read on some thermometers. We have the possibility of immersion error that we discussed, and then parallax error, reading it not at eye level. Now, liquid and glass thermometers can't be used in automatic controllers because they produce no signal, no electrical or pressure or mechanical signal or otherwise. Let's look at page 21. There are, in fact, high precision thermometers used for calorimetric determinations. We'll use one this semester. They have scale divisions of smaller increments. And with a magnifier, it can be read to plus or minus 002 Celsius or plus or minus 005 Fahrenheit. Highly accurate. Exposed stem corrections for mercury thermometers. We've already mentioned the importance of immersing a thermometer to the correct depth to get the correct reading. It's not always possible to do that, particularly if you have a small sample and a big thermometer. So there is a way to correct for that, and I have an explanation of it here.
and on the next page, but it's best to perhaps to go to the next page and just work through the example with you as I explain it. So page 22, please. So page 22 says, determine the corrected temperature reading for a total immersion Pyrex thermometer that is immersed to the 20 degrees C mark on the scale and reads 200 degrees Celsius, that's the temperature it's reading. Ambient temperature at the midpoint of the exposed mercury column is 35 Celsius. So I'll explain as we go here, but look at the setup. We have a liquid in a beaker that's very hot. It's somewhere around 200 degrees Celsius. So the mercury in the thermometer bead is at about the 200 degree mark. So it's reading 200 degrees C. It's hot. Now this, being a total immersion thermometer, should be immersed right up to the top of the mercury thread, but of course it can't be because we don't have much of a sample here. Now one idea would go get a bulb immersion thermometer and do it properly, but let's say you don't have a bulb immersion thermometer, or for some reason you want to just correct it. Here's how that's done. We use the stem correction formula. Your stem correction that you would add or subtract to your reading is K times N times T measured myon minus T exposed. K is a constant. It's a net expansion coefficient of mercury in glass. has units of Celsius degrees to the minus 1. So it's a constant value. For Celsius degrees, the values are triple O one six four if you're reading a temperature near 100 Celsius, and it's triple O one seven four if you're reading a temperature near 300 Celsius. And we can calculate the value at some other temperature using these two values and linear interpolation, right? If you happen to be measuring Fahrenheit, divide K by 1.8 because, again, the Fahrenheit scale is exaggerated uh, 1.8 times that of Celsius. In this formula, N is the length measured in degrees of the exposed section of the mercury column. So in this picture, the exposed section of the mercury column is this length. This is exposed, and it's not measured with a ruler, but it's actually measured in degrees. So we have 200 degrees is the upper value, and the 20 degrees C mark on the thermometer is the lower end of the exposed section. So 200 minus 20 tells us 180 Celsius degree divisions that are exposed on the thermometer, and that's N. Then we have T measured minus T exposed. Well, T measured is the observed temperature. In this case, it's 200 degrees Celsius. What about T exposed? That's the temperature of the mercury that is exposed. So here, this section of mercury all the way up here is exposed. That is, it's not in the liquid. What's the temperature of that mercury? Let's assume air temperature is about room temperature. Let's say it's about 20 degrees Celsius or 25, somewhere in there. What would be the temperature of the exposed mercury? Well, it's probably hotter because it's sitting above the hot liquid and vapors and hot heat from the hot plate might be rising. In any case, take another thermometer and measure the temperature of the air or the thermometer right about the midpoint of the exposed section. In this example, I'm just saying it's about 35 Celsius that's measured. Okay, so that's T exposed. All right, so let's do the calculation and see what kind of correction we need. Our correction, which is in Celsius degrees, is equal to K times N times T measured minus T exposed. The expansion coefficient factor K is triple O one sixty four at a hundred degrees Celsius, triple O one seventy four at three hundred degrees Celsius, what should we use at about two hundred degrees Celsius where we are at? Well that would be the midpoint. You could use any kind of linear interpolation, you could use linear regression, you can do some algebra, but basically the midpoint of these two values for two hundred degrees C is about zero zero zero. What's the midpoint of one sixty four and one seventy four? How about one six nine? Right? That's about the midpoint. So that's point zero 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 one six nine per Celsius degree.
n is the number of degrees exposed, recall. The degrees exposed are between 200 and 20, and therefore that difference is 180 degrees that are exposed on the thermometer. And then we have T measured minus T exposed. So T measured was 200 degrees. And then we had the exposed section halfway up the thermometer outside we said was measured at about 35 degrees Celsius with another thermometer, 35 degrees C. So that difference is 165 Celsius degrees. So if you take your calculator and work this out, you'll find the correction in Celsius degrees looks out to be oh, 5.0, but I'm not going to put the decimal in, it's probably not that accurate, about 5 Celsius degrees. And we see there is some cancellation of units here, Celsius degrees, Celsius degrees, and the answer is in Celsius degrees. And so you would then add or subtract that correction. Now, do we add or subtract it in this case? Well, should this temperature be reading higher or lower? Well, if this thermometer was totally immersed, as it's supposed to be, to the top of the mercury bead, well, clearly that would be a larger reading because the mercury would be more expanded. So we need to add this uh, correction to our reading of 200. So that'll be then 200 degrees plus 5 Celsius degrees. It should be reading actually about 205 degrees Celsius. If you were measuring the temperature of a cold liquid, then you would subtract your correction because the exposed portion of the mercury is not contracted as much as it should be. Take a look at page 23. Page 23, uh, thermometer calibration curves. Liquid and glass thermometers that are used for high precision work will need to be calibrated from time to time. So how do we calibrate a liquid and glass thermometer? Well, you can purchase five or six very pure compounds whose melting points are in the temperature range where you want to read your thermometer. And from the melting points of these pure compounds measured with the particular thermometer, you can create a calibration graph as shown here. So just as an example, let's say you pure benzoic acid melts at 122.4 degrees Celsius, that's the literature value. If your thermometer read 120.4 for the melting point, then you know that you're reading 2 degrees too low. You'd have a correction factor of plus 2 Celsius degrees for any temperature readings in that vicinity. So here's an example of a calibration graph. This is the correction factor that you would add to your reading in the vicinity that you're using it. So for example, at 120 degrees Celsius in this case, the worker would have to add 1.8 degrees to the reading observed. Down here, if they're taking a reading around 90, they should be subtracting 0.4 degrees. You might think this is surprising, but we actually get a calibration graph just like this when you purchase an expensive thermometer. This comes with it. Some other factors to consider. As with other instruments like burettes and pipettes, you want to be careful to take readings at eye level to avoid parallax errors. Right? Reading at an angle won't give exactly the right value. Now, in the case of thermometers, parallax errors can be eliminated by reading with a reading lens. There's a reading lens here that you see. Reading lenses have an eyepiece that will slide in and out, like so, and that allows you to adjust to focus for your eye. There's a spring that snaps onto the back of the thermometer to hold it in place. For accurate work, standardization must be carried out periodically, and that's because glass exhibits cold flow. What is that? Well, it actually flows a little bit, very small amount, but well below the melting point. And slow, permanent changes in glass result in changes of volume of the bulb. And so 
readings change as glass ages. Now, here's some photos of um, old, old windows that perhaps were once clear and not so clear now. This is a bit controversial. Uh, most authors discuss cold flow, and yet I've read some articles, people vehemently saying it's not true, so uh, I'll leave that one with you to decide. And finally here, hysteresis. So a thermometer should be read whenever possible with a rising mercury thread rather than a falling mercury thread. So it reads more accurately if we take the reading as the mercury thread is rising rather than falling. In either case, it's good practice to tap the thermometer gently before reading to minimize sticking. On a final note, if a mercury thermometer is kept at 100 degrees Celsius for a few minutes, like in a beaker of boiling water, and then placed into an ice bath, it will read below 0 degrees C for several hours. And this effect is due to the slow contraction rate of glass. So that's enough for liquid and glass thermometers.